Hi everybody, this is Regina Feeney, librarian and archivist at the Freeport Memorial Library. Today's program is The Jews of Freeport, a brief history of early Jewish culture in the village of Freeport. This program came about several years ago when I was approached by Jill Kaplan, who asked me to do a program for her local Hadassah. I had already just done a program at Jimmy's Junkyard, and she was thinking maybe I could do um, a repeat of that uh, program. But I said to her, maybe we could do something a little on target for, for Hadassah. Maybe I could do something about the history of, of Jewish people in, in Freeport. And she said, do you think you could do that? And I said, I'll try. What, what Jill didn't know is that several years earlier, I had uh, went to B'nai Israel and did an oral history of, of Bernie Calvin and uh, Marvin Cohen um, for just doing some research. And one of the things that that oral history led me to uh, was a, a presentation that I did uh, several years back on uh, the history of where free porters are buried. And uh, Mr. Calvin and, and Mr. Cohen told me that B'nai Israel Cemetery was Old Montefiore Cemetery in Springfield Gardens. And I had taken a trip there, which I will talk about my adventures and misadventures in a Jewish cemetery in Queens in, in a little bit. Um, but I had sort of documented uh, many of the Jewish families, so I figured that was one place to start. Um, for those of you who know the type of research I do, my goal was always trying to find the earliest mention of something, right? I always want to see how far back I can go. And what this research uh, led me to is the fact that I was able to find Jewish people living in the village of Freeport as far back as 1870 which is probably about 20 years earlier than I would have suspected. Now, I'm not saying that there weren't Jewish people in Freeport uh, before 1870. 1870 is the first documented um, person I could find uh, with living within uh, the boundaries of the village of Freeport. For those of you who are not familiar with Freeport, Freeport does have a long history of diversity. In the top left picture, this is a picture of a, a scene in one of the, uh, in the school in the village of Freeport. This was a glass negative um, that we have at the Freeport Historical Society. It was part of the Lewis Ross collection. And it's hard to see, but somewhere in that Christmas tree is a calendar. And going into that, kind of scanning into that, that calendar, you could see that it says the month January, and you could see the, the dates um, and the days of the week. And using a petrol calendar, we were able to determine that that was January 1893. So this has got to be the 1892-1893 school year. That is significant because that is the year that the Village of Freeport incorporated. And so we know a little bit about what Freeport was like because we, right before the Village incorporated, a local census uh, was conducted. Um, we also know that Lewis Ross, he was also on the school board at the time, and his son is sitting in the second row, a little blonde boy in a white shirt over to the right-hand side. Now, according to the, the census, there were 1,382 people living within the village of Freeport. And of that, uh, 1,272, were American born. That included 13 African Americans. And if you see they're sitting in the front row and along the um, left hand side, you see some African American children. We know that these, these 13 uh, people, African American people living in Freeport, most likely were, was Moses Jarvis, his wife Henrietta, and their 11 children. And we, you'll learn more about that when we, when we do the program on the history of Bennington Park. We also know that there, there were about 110 foreign-born um, people living in Freeport at the time. And the largest ethnic group, believe it or not, of foreign-borns living in Freeport in 1892 were Italians. There were 35 Italians living um, in the village of Freeport. Now, we know that this is a, a racially diverse group. Um, it's probably socioeconomically diverse. We have, you know, 
um, Lewis Ross's son, who Lewis Ross was a very prominent businessman in Freeport. He did business with John J. Randall. Um, but along the back, there's a little boy standing closest to the Christmas tree on the left-hand side. And if you look very closely, he does have a hair lip. So this is also a uh, socially, economically, um, also diverse uh, group of people here. Interesting to note that that school is going to burn down in January of 1893, and I wonder if the dried out Christmas tree along with the uh, uh, gas lighting might have had something to do with it. The picture to the right is uh, one of the many sports teams that was, um, was started within the Freeport schools. And we do know that, um, that the, one of the, the one of the, the families that was very big into sports was the Levy family. So we know that George uh, Morton and his brother David were very active in sports, especially baseball. Um, and David Levy is in that photograph. Um, as for the, the breakdown of, of Freeport by, by the census, um, we, we don't know, it doesn't say people's um, religious affiliations, but we do know there were about 16 people from Germany. There were about three people from Russia and uh, one from a uh, person from Austria. And there were 22 people from England. And we do know that some of our early um, Jewish residents were originally from England. Now, finding out information about who is Jewish and who's not Jewish before the founding of, uh, of, um, of B'nai Israel is quite different, difficult because names are very difficult to track back. Um, biblical names like Abraham, Moses, and David are very common in, with Christians at the time. Um, and, and names like Miller could either be Christian or they could be Jewish. So until uh, Bethel, I'm sorry, until um, B'nai is founded, it is, it's very difficult to figure out um, who, might be, who might be Jewish. Once we have, um, B'nai, we're able then, we, we see a lot of articles in the paper about who's going to services, who's getting married, and then we're able to say, okay, they're Jewish, and then we're able to trace people back further. And that's how I found somebody back as far back as in 18, um, the 1870s. So um, before um, B'nai was founded, a lot of people who were Jewish living in this area would have attended services in Rockwell Center. So you might be familiar with this book, Seeking Sanctuary, 125 Years of Synagogues on Long Island, which was written by Brad uh, Colindy. The author approached me um, while he was doing research and asked to, for photo rights to use that photo on the right-hand side, which kind of, I thought was, struck me because it is a picture, again, a glass negative, taken from the blizzard of 1888 in Hempstead um and one of the things that we do at freeport is when we, we we scan these things we we try to transcribe everything that's in the photograph so that you see a lot of signs um and and that was what brad was able to find uh that's how he found this photograph because according to to brad um that one of those offices um was used as one of the places where one of the first religious services was was carried out. Um, and according to Brad, a small group of men from Hempstead, Freeport, and Rockwell Center gathered on October 24th, 1897 at the home of department store owner Lewis Cohen in Hempstead to discuss the forming of a congregation. At the second meeting, two weeks later, the group became, became known as the Hebrew Union of the town of Hempstead with the objective of building a synagogue and establishing a cemetery. Free Porter Moses Miller hosted the next meeting at his home on November 21st, where the bylaws were adopted and the following officers were elected. Um, and they included uh, uh, Adolf Rosenthal of Hempstead, Morris Miller uh, of Freeport, Michael Morrison of Hempstead, uh, Louis Aronson of Rockwell Center, and, um, and Henry um, uh, Gobitz of, of Freeport. And on November 28, 1897, the first worship service was held in the dentist office of Dr. Rosenthal on Main Street in Hempstead. So it's very interesting that, that this, this person who's writing this book on the history of synagogues on Long Island was able to take one of our photographs 
and that is not a free port, but actually was able to find a free port connection to it. So we were very grateful for that. And here is an article I was able to find in our Queens County Review. Um, and it, it's really talking about how that Hebrew society really never went anywhere. Um, after several months, uh, a disagreement over what to do first, either build a synagogue or establish a cemetery, really led to um, the disbandment of, of the, the Hebrew uh, Union on May 1st, uh, 1898. But B'nai Israel is formed around, in, around in 1915, and it is the first time um, Freeport Jews are mentioned in our local papers. And here we see um, a celebration of Rosh Hashanah, and you may note that the spelling is different. Um, and this was a celebration at Brooklyn Hall, it had 100 participants. If you're not familiar with Brooklyn Hall, Brooklyn Hall is on, um, on Brooklyn Avenue and um, uh, North Grove Street. Kind of, there's a 7-Eleven there now, right across from the railroad tracks. And, um, and basically, um, what we see is sort of this push to actually have a synagogue uh, built within uh, the boundaries of the village of Freeport. So the congregation was formed in 1915, and it's according to articles, there were 50 Jewish members uh, from Freeport and its uh, vicinity. And it's interesting here that um, this article talks about a Hebrew Sunday school. And when they had their Rosh Hashanah, Hashanah services, um, it, was, it was interesting that the rabbi was identified as Reverend Isidore Epstein. So when they were looking for property, to build a synagogue in Freeport. They found this really interesting uh, location on, on Broadway and Mount. And I always like this, this picture, uh, this map, because it showed that there was a brewing company there, or at least the brewing company owned it. There is no evidence that uh, beer was being brewed in Freeport. Most likely it was a storage area, but this is where um, the original B'nai Israel gets uh, uh, built. And we see here, according to the newspapers, uh, the laying of the cornerstone of Bidet. And interesting to note that one of the first, uh, the oldest member of the congregation is identified as, as Morris Miller. And he was one of the members of uh, the original Hebrew Union that disbanded. Congregation Bidet Israel um, uh, was, was able to dedicate its uh, synagogue um, on September 25th. Uh, 1921, um, and it's uh, Freeporter C. Kern was the architect, and Freeporter James H. Lindsay was the, the builder. Um, the synagogue also established a burial place for its members of the congregation at Montefiore Cemetery in Springfield Gardens, and that cemetery was originally established in 1908. Um, though the temple is, is no longer a temple, it, is, it became a uh, Greek Orthodox Church, and now it's a Christian church, um, but the building is still there, and it today it, it is the oldest still standing synagogue building in Nassau County. And we can see that in 1946, um, the temple does buy uh, adjacent land uh, for building um, an extension, um, and that that extension cost about $16,000. It had uh, 16 rooms, and it more than doubled the property of B'nai Israel. So B'nai Israel starts to expand. However, as time goes by, the older building has a lot more, has a lot of problems. It's running out of space. That corner property, there was, there was no way that they could expand anymore. And things like um, radiators are falling off the, the walls, and people thought it was dangerous. And a group got together and said, we, we need to think we, we need to build a, a bigger synagogue on a bigger uh, piece of property. When I interviewed um, uh, Bernie Calvin and Marvin Cohen, um, it was asked whether, because this has been said that the reason why B'nai moved from Northeast Freeport to Northwest Freeport is because there was changing demographics in that part of, of the village. And according to these two gentlemen, that's not the case at all. The, the synagogue needed a bigger piece of land because they needed to build a bigger um, facility. And so they really needed to start fresh. And that is why um, eventually um, the synagogue did move over to uh, Brookside Avenue. 
And now groundbreaking for this new um, synagogue took place on December 23rd, 1956. And it was located, it's located at 77 North Brookside Avenue. Harry Shapiro was the chairman of the building uh, fund committee. And according to some of the uh, literature that we have, um, if you paid $10, that entitled you to do some of the actual shoveling of, of, of the groundbreaking. And pictured uh, to the bottom uh, left, we see uh, Harry Shapiro, Rabbi Katz, and um, uh, Herman um, Rosenstein, who is president of the congregation. And here we see the dedication brochure of, of um, the B'nai Israel. One of the cool things that we do have at the Freeport Historical Society was very helpful in doing any research on, for, for this program was the Temple Messenger, which was the official newsletter of the congregation. And we have a bunch of these newsletters um, at the museum. The earliest goes back to about 1939. They were dedicated, they were given to us by Rabbi Katz. Now Rabbi Katz was, he saved so much. He was a bit of a pack rat, but you know, for our purposes that worked out really well. So we have a lot of this information. And the goal is in the future is to um, get as much of this stuff digitized um, so uh, we can make all of this searchable to make research um, a, lot more, a lot easier. Okay, so this is just another thing we found in the, the box of materials that Rabbi Katz had saved. And here is just, um, it is a Hadassah anniversary. And since the, we originally did this program for Hadassah, I thought it'd be interesting to show um, the ladies um, uh, the, some, some information about the, the early Freeport Hadassah. Now, B'nai Israel was not the first synagogue, uh, was not the only synagogue in Freeport. There was the Union Reform uh, Temple and Union Reform Congregation, which began its services on October 1953. Um, and this, this temple served the Baldwin, uh, Freeport, and Roosevelt area. Uh, first services were held at 1 East Sunrise Highway, and later that year services were held in the Old Baptist Church, which was located at 74 South Grove Street, which is, which is now Gallimbardo Avenue. Now, this you can see a picture of that church that later was used by the Reform Union Reform Temple. If it looks familiar, you may have seen it sort of depicted in um, a mural that is in the uh, Freeport Post Office. This, this uh, painting was um, done by William Gropper. He actually painted two murals for the Freeport Post Office as part of a uh, New Deal program part of the Treasury Relief Art Program, known as TARP. Um, and the, the one program, uh, the one um, panel feature uh, is, that I am um, show here is called um, Suburban Post in Winter. Now, Gropper was not a free porter, so, but he has a very interesting story. Um, according to the Smithsonian, William Gropper's parents were Jewish immigrants who worked in sweatshops in New York City's garment district. After winning several prizes for drawings, Gropper took a job with the New York Tribune, but his bosses discovered his contributions to left-wing magazines and then uh, soon fired him. In 1937, Gropper had his first show and the New, York, uh, the New Yorker magazine described him as one of the most accomplished as well as one of the most significant artists of our generation. During the Red Scare of the post-war years, conservatives grew suspicious of his images that lambasted the rich and powerful. Gropper was asked to appear uh, before the McCarthy Senate uh, Permanent Investigation Subcommittee, where he took the Fifth Amendment. He was branded a communist uh, and saw so, so some of his gallery shows canceled. Um, this experience did not stop the artist from making satirical images about war, prejudice, greed, and exploitation into his, uh, into his late 70s. And so we're very honored to have um, a Gropper painting here in the village of Freeport. So the Union Reform uh, Temple building and school, um, the building is located at 475 North Brookside Avenue and was dedicated on October 14, 1960. Uh, Percival Goodman was the architect, planner, and artist. Um, Goodman is recognized as the nation's uh, leading designer of synagogues. Between 1936 and 1979, he designed more than 50 synagogues and religious buildings in the United States, and this includes um, Fifth Avenue Synagogue. And Goodman's goal was to design synagogues that interpreted Jewish tradition in modern ways, and he died at the age of 85 in 1989. Uh, 
Now, uh, the temple, Union Reform Temple, welcomed Temple Emmanuel of Baldwin in a merger on February 25th, 1966. And later, the temple, uh, the Union Reform Temple merged with a temple in Oceanside in April 2000. The now, now the temple is home to a, a Hispanic Christian church. Okay, so I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the notable Jewish families and individuals. Now, I mentioned before that I had this uh, interesting trip to a uh, old Montefiore cemetery several years prior. Um, as an archivist, I see tombstones as primary documents. So for me, wanting to go and, and looking at these tombstones, I can always get a little inf more information about people uh, when, I, when I see them. Um, so I tell my coworker at the library that I'm going to go over to Old Montefiore. Now, my coworker, who, who is Jewish and his son is a rabbi, mentioned to me, you know, Regina, you can't go there on a Saturday because it's going to be closed, which I didn't know that. But once she mentioned it, it made sense. Um, so I went on Sunday. Um, the cemetery has its internment list online, so I thought I knew exactly where I was going in the cemetery. I get there, and this is a very old cemetery. It was uh, established about 1908. The roadways are very, very narrow. This has to do with um, the way um, Jewish people are buried. They're not buried stacked. They are buried side by side. So there is a need to use every uh, piece of space um, to, you know, so, so there's, there's a high density of tombstones uh, and plots, and they're all very close to each other. And the, when the cemetery was established, they weren't expecting somebody like me in a big SUV driving through. So I start to drive in, and I realize I can't turn around. I'm committed. And the tombstones are right up against the roadway. And some of these tombstones are like over six foot tall, and it was very, very unnerving. Um, I get completely lost because I, where I thought the section was supposed to be, it was not there. And out of nowhere, a young um, Hasidic Jewish man walked into the roadway, we're in front of me from behind one of these tombstones. And both of us looked at each other in shock because nobody, neither one of us was expecting the other. Um, and we kind of looked at each other like, what are you doing here? But, you know, um, so I didn't hit him, he was happy, but I couldn't, I, I didn't find out why he was there until later when I learned that a very famous rabbi is, is um, buried there and a lot of people go um, to pay their respects uh, at his gravesite. So I make my way back to the, uh, the cemetery uh, entrance to go talk to them in the office. Um, for those of you who don't know me, um, when I did my, my DNA test, I am 96% Irish and I look it. So when I walked into the office, people kind of looked at me like, what, are you lost? But the very nice woman behind the counter um, asked how she could help me. And I identified myself as being with the Historic Society, doing research on uh, Jewish families from Freeport. And I was like, I cannot find um, this burial section. I, you know, it says on your, on your internment list, it's in this one section. And so she was kind enough to pull out a map and I immediately saw my problem. The numbering system goes right to left, um, which is something that I didn't know at the time, but makes perfect sense. And I was able to um, get to that section and, um, and actually document the tombstones there. So in this, when I talk about some of these families, if I don't have pictures of people or um, pictures of businesses that they might have might have owned or ads that might have been in the paper, I will include some of the, their tombstones. So as mentioned, the Miller family is probably the oldest documented Jewish family within the village of Freeport. Um, they, they, the family ran a dry goods store at 92 South Main Street. Um, Moses Miller, uh, son um, Isaac uh, Miller, was born in Freeport in 1878. He graduated Freeport schools in 1893. And it is said that um, he had Miss Atkinson as a teacher. Um, Isaac went on to work as a reporter for the Brooklyn Daily Eagle and the New York Times. Uh, he was also an athlete. He uh, competed in bicycle track and played center field in Freeport semi-professional baseball team. And a lot of, um, a lot of Jewish uh, men did play in those uh, semi-professional um, uh, leagues. We know the, the Levy brothers also. 
Okay, so we're going to talk about Isaac de Silva. Uh, Isaac's real name is Isidore. Uh, he was a pioneering businessman, um, and he was born in England. He came to the United States at the age of five and moved to Freeport in 1880. Um, he started a business at the age of 15 in Sayville. In 1919, he incorporated his business under the name De Silva 5, 10, and 25 cent store corporation. He had two stores in Freeport uh, and a store in Rockville Center, Rockville Center, Huntington, and Oyster Bay. De Silva's children included Louis, Jacob, Moses, Louise, and Daniel, and they were all involved in the family business. Uh, it's interesting to note that name De Silva comes up a lot because a lot of the postcards that we have at the Freeport historic site were published by De Silva's. Um, De Silva was involved in many civic organizations, including the Elks Club, the Masons, the Freeport Club, the Foresters of America, and the Independent Order of Oddfellows. Uh, De Silva and his wife, Annie, are buried at Old Montefiore Cemetery in Springfield Gardens. The Schloss family. Um, the patriarch of the family was Hyman Schloss, uh, who was also a merchant in Freeport. Um, Hyman was born in Russia and immigrated to the United States when he was 25 years old and settled in Freeport in 1890. Schloss's stores were at one time the largest department store in Freeport. Around 1909, this store was the first on Main Street to install uh, gas lamps at the front of the building. Um, his store was also the first to produce uh, window displays and install electric lighting inside the building. Uh, Schloss was a charter member of the Wide Awake Engine Company Number no. 1, of the Freeport Fire Department, as well as a charter member of the Freeport Exempt Firemen's Association. Schloss was also a charter member of the Sunrise Lodge, which was a Masons organization, and charter member of the Elks Club. He was director of Citizens National Bank. Schloss belonged to many organizations, including the Lights Club, uh, the Tuscan Fellowship, Fellow Craft Club, the Freeport Chamber of Congress, Commerce, uh, the Lodge of the Rebecca's, um, and the family lived at 131 South Grove Street, which is now Guy Lombardo Avenue. Uh, he lived there with his family, and including his wife, Lillian. They had two sons, Dr. Mervyn L. and uh, Lawrence Leo Schloss. In 1978, Dr. Mervyn Schloss donated to the Freeport Memorial Library uh, the Carillon um, sculpture and, and plaque uh, on the side, uh, the east side of the Freeport Library building, and he dedicated it to the memory of his parents. Uh, Hyman Schloss was also uh, vice president of B'nai Israel from 1926 um, to 1947. And we see an invitation here. Uh, that's the picture of, of Hyman and his wife Lillian. This is for their golden wedding anniversary. The couple is buried at Mount Ararat Cemetery. Um, Lillian Schloss was also a very interesting woman. She organized the Jewish Ladies Aid Society in Hempstead and served as its president for 25 years. She was a member, her, member of the Sisterhood of, the, of Temple Israel and was the group's treasurer. She belonged to the auxiliary of the Freeport uh, Exempt Firemen's Association, the Garden City um, chapter of the Order of the Eastern Star and the National Council of Jewish Women. And she died in 19, uh, she died at the age of 87 in 1962. So here we have the Barish family. Um, Harry Barish was a prominent merchant as well as a charter member and first president of the Freeport Chamber of Commerce. He was born in Austria and he came to the United States around 1897. He uh, was an organizer of Temple B'nai Israel and served as its president for many years. In 1921, Barish was also involved um, in the movement to construct the first permanent home um, for uh, this temple at the corner of Broadway and Mount. Um, he was, um, uh, he, he was also one of the original organizers of Playland Park, an amusement park located in South Freeport. And the Barish Department Store was located at 65 South Main Street. Um, and that is where I got all my Our Holy Redeemer Catholic uh, school uniforms there. The Barish family lived at 95 uh, North Long Beach Avenue. Simon Bauman uh, was born in France and uh, lived in the United States for 63 years. He opened a furniture store in Astoria in 1887, and then later opened a store in Freeport in 1914. Uh, he also had a store in Hempstead and, Jer and Jersey City, and he moved to Freeport about 1914 and lived at 64 South Ocean Avenue. He died in 1945, uh, 44. Um, he was the oldest member of the Queensboro Lodge of the 
Benevolent Protective Order of Elks. He was a member of the Royal Arcanium and a member of B'nai Israel. And he is buried um, at Mount Hebron Cemetery in Queens. The Varmus family. So Dr. Um, uh, Varmus uh, was a local doctor for 35 years. He was a general practitioner. Uh, he went on, uh, he was also past president of Doctors Hospital. Dr. Varmus was also on staff at the uh, South NASA Communities Hospital and uh, was, uh, at the NASA County Medical Center. And the family had a house um, at 188 West Merrick Road. Um, you might be more familiar with his son, Harold Varmus. Um, he uh, graduated Freeport High School and just happened to win a, a Nobel Prize um, in science. He was also the 14th director of the National Cancer Institute, a post to which he was appointed by President Barack Obama. Uh, below uh, the tombstone of uh, Frank Farmers, you're going to see a URL for um, uh, the PBS show uh, Finding Your Roots, in which um, Dr. Howard Varmus was featured. And if you stay to the credits, um, I get mentioned the credits because I was contacted by them in helping do research on, on, on Dr. Varmus. And the great thing about that PBS uh, program is how, um, how ha he talked about growing up in Freeport in such, in, in such happy terms, like he really enjoyed living in, in the village of Freeport, had such wonderful members of the community. This is the Appleton family. Um, the patriarch was Lewis Appleton. He founded the Appleton Hardware Company in Freeport in 1922. He was born in Russia. Um, Appleton had been a resident of Freeport since 1915. His wife was Ruth S. Appleton. And for several decades, uh, the Appleton family lived at 47 North Long Beach Avenue. In the 1916, the Appletons lived at 11 King Street. Now, according to the 1920 census, Appleton's profession was listed as jo silk jobbing. Um, in 1933, a Appleton was elected president of Congregation B'nai Israel. Um, in 1942, he was treasurer of the Freeport Chamber of Commerce. Appleton died in 1985 at the age of uh, 94 and is buried in um, Old Montefiore Cemetery. Uh, his son, Dr. Uh, Arnold uh, Burt Appleton, um, uh, was a graduate of Freeport High School. He graduated in 1935. He studied dentistry at the University of Pennsylvania. In 1942, he entered the army and was assigned to the dental division of the medical corps. Uh, he later opened a practice in Freeport at 93 South Main Street. Around 1942, he married Edith Farber. The couple had one son, Kenneth. But sadly, after a long illness, Appleton died at Mount Sinai Hospital at the age of 31 and he's buried um, in, also buried at Old Montefiore Cemetery. Here's the, the, the tombstone for the Posner family. The main may not sound familiar, but you probably know their business, Freeport Glazing Works, which is probably one of the older businesses in the village of Freeport at 23 East Merrick Road, right next to uh, the Freeport Recreation Center. Here is the Shebar family. Um, Harry Shebar served as president of um, B'nai Israel. Um, very funny story about the, the Shebars. During the 1920s, the family did own a Chinese restaurant. And um, according to the press, that Chinese restaurant was raided by prohibition agents on St. Patrick's Day, which I just think is very funny. A Jewish family owning a Chinese restaurant that gets raided on St. Patrick's Day, which there's nothing more to say about that. Okay, the Danziger family. Um, uh, in the late 1940s, uh, Milton Danziger served as president of B'nai Israel, um, and they owned um, a, a sporting goods store in, in Freeport on uh, 70 South Main Street. Abraham Siegel uh, was owner of A. Siegel and Companies. This was a paint store located at 99 South Main Street. Siegel moved to, uh, to Freeport from Greenport, Brooklyn in 1916 at the age of 22, uh, and that's the same year he founded his paint and wallpaper store. The store was originally located at, at 81 South Main Street. Um, and uh, in 1923, Siegel helped found the Freeport Federal Savings and Loan Association, which later became the South Shore Federal and Savings and Loan Association. Um, and for the first 10 years of its existence, the bank operated out of uh, Siegel's paint store. Siegel married uh, Martha, 
Goldstein in 1916, and the couple um, resided at 211 Pine Street with their three children. Uh, Siegel was often referred to as Mr. Freeport due to his many affiliations with local clubs and organizations. He was involved in the founding of B'nai Israel and served as its trustee. He organized the Justice Lodge of B'nai Birth. Uh, Siegel was a charter member of the Freeport Chamber of Commerce. He was a life member of the Elks Club and the Sunrise Masonic Lodge. Um, Siegel served as Freeport Parks Commissioner from 1936 to 1948. He was also founder and, and past president of the Paint Dealers Institution of America. And in 1959, he became um, the Massapequa Chamber of Commerce president. Siegel died at the, uh, the age of 72. Uh, William Flaster um, was the owner of um, Toyland, which was located at 13 West Merrick Road. Um, they, uh, you can see, uh, I don't have a lot of pictures, and unfortunately the one picture I do have was a, a disastrous fire that took place there. Max Griffin Hagen, a lot of people don't know him because he really, um, he lived in Freeport but was not involved uh, in B'nai Israel, but has a really interesting story. Um, the family had a house at 314 South Ocean Avenue, um, and he was the former sheriff of New, New York County. He was born in Chicago, and after his father um, died, um, his family moved uh, to New York City. Um, in his teens, Griffith Hagen moved to Denver, Colorado, and engaged in the cattle industry for six years. He later moved back to New York, in 1880, Griffenhagen and his brother formed the Griffenhagen Brothers, which is a wholesale dealer uh, and manufacturer of bottles. Their company was one of the largest in the company, and he helped found the Duffy Mott Company, Inc., which manufactured and sold ciders and vinegars and the Monopole Vineyard Corporation in, in Rhymes, New York. Um, during Prohibition, um, this company stayed in business because it sold uh, sacramental wines and non-alcoholic beverages. Somehow they are related to Mott's, of like the, uh, the Mott's fruits. Um, and uh, Griffin Hagen uh, served as the Republican alderman uh, representing Washington Heights, Washington Heights in 1904. In 1909, he was elected New York County Register and in 1913 was elected sheriff. Um, Henry Thaw, the murder of Stanford White, was among Griffin Hagen's prisoners. Griffin Hagen helped uh, political reformers and their corrupt practice of paying fees directly to the sheriff. In 1913, Max Griffin Hagen purchased what, is, what was referred to as Stonehurst, a house in Freeport as a summer residence. In 1916, um, he purchased the Grove Hotel located at 98 Rose Street for $60,000. He and his wife, uh, Carrie, lived in Freeport um, until. Um, her death in 1942. In 1922, um, he, was, uh, a, he was on the executive committee uh, for the campaign for Jewish war sufferers. Um, his name uh, is mentioned in such journal as the Advocate, America's Jewish Journal, the American Hebrew and Jewish Me uh, Messenger, the Anna Report of the Jewish Aid Society. Um, he was involved in the Hebrew Orphan Asylum of New York, and possibly was one of its trustees. And he, he is buried um, in Temple Israel's uh, cemetery on Hastings on Hudson. Adolf Levy. Adolf Levy was a local businessman in Freeport and the father of George Morton, and uh, who was a prominent attorney um, in, in, in Freeport. And his other son was David Levy, who went on to be a prominent merchant. Adolf Levy was born in Russia in 1854. Uh, where he became a successful merchant. He, Levy came to America and worked as a salesman, and he later opened a hotel known as Adolf's Place. Um, after the, the, the hotel was sold, Levy and his wife Anna and their three children, Jean, David, and George, moved to Freeport. Um, here, Levy purchased a haberdashery. Uh, the store became a successful men's clothing store known as uh, Adolf Levy and Son. Later, Levy's son David assumed ownership of the building. Uh, as mentioned uh, before, uh, David Levy, who was very involved in sports, here's a picture of him. Um, David Levy was a merchant and bank director in Freeport. He was a proprietor of the store founded by his father, Adolf Levy and Son, a men's clothing store. Um, he was a charter member of the Exchange Club and served as its president. He was the director of the Freeport Bank as well as the Long Island uh, Trust Company. 
For about 10 years, uh, Levy was the town of Hempstead councilman. Uh, David Levy and his wife Florence lived at 246 South Ocean Avenue. George Morton Levy was a very prominent attorney in Freeport um, and was known as the founder and president of Roosevelt Raceway. He was born in Seaford, New York, uh, where his parents owned that hotel. Um, later, his father opened uh, the Attic Levy Sons uh, clothing store on South Main Street. Um, he attended Freeport High School. He was vice president of the debating club, played baseball and football. After graduating in 1904, Levy attended New York University. He graduated from that institution with a law degree in 1908. He briefly worked for uh, the law and real estate firm of Smith and Levy. And in 1911, he entered up into a partnership with attorney Elvin N. Edwards. Levy became a successful criminal attorney. Um, the first case to bring him international notoriety was the murder of Louise Bailey. Um, and the story is that Mrs. Florence Carmen was accused of killing Mrs. Bailey, who was a patient of her husband, Dr. Edward Carmen. Um, this murder took place uh, in um, right on Merrick Road, right next to where the post office is today. After two trials, Mrs. Carmen was acquitted. Um, and um, during Prohibition, uh, George Morton Levy took on the cases of many accused rum runners, and uh, many of them got off. He was obviously a very good attorney. He also defended mobster Lucky, uh, Lucky Luciano in 1936. Uh, Levy was friend and golf partner uh, of the of underworld crime boss Frank Costello. Uh, Levy was inducted into the Hall of Fame of the uh, of the Trotters. Um, a horse organization in Goshen, New York in 1966. Uh, Levy, Levy died at the age of 98 and is buried in Greenfield Cemetery in Uniondale. Uh, the Frisch family, um, they owned Jack and Jill Ch Children's Shop, which was located at 83 South Main Street um, in the 40s and 1950s. Um, and the family lived at 51 Charnard Avenue and were, were members of Congregation Benoit Israel. The Green family, um, owners of Carol Green's, which was a ladies apparel store located at 80 South Main Street. The store was founded by brothers uh, Jack and Harry Green around 1930. The store took its name for Jack's daughter, Carol. It was originally located at 60 South Main Street. Um, and Carol, Carol Green uh, eventually took over the space that was occupied by Litwitz Department Store at 80 South Main Street. Um, in 1922, the location was the site uh, of Schloss's department store. Uh, Carol Green also had a location in Hempstead. Um, during, uh, during a Freeport war bond campaign in 1943, Carol Green purchased $12,500 in bonds. And it was reported that this was the largest individual purchase for the Freeport campaign. When Jack retired uh, from the store and moved to Florida, relatives Walter and Ruth Green managed the business. In 1965, Carol Green celebrated its grand reopening and redesign. Um, Carol Green and its neighbors, um, Irving Men's Store, was damaged uh, during a fire in 1972. Carol Green celebrates 50th anniversary in 1981. Um, and in December of, of that year, Walter retired from the business and the store closed. Uh, the Green family was very much associated with B'nai Israel. Um, Carol Green was confirmed. Um, Carol Green was confirmed in the temple in 1943. Uh, she married Ira J. Kaplan in 1950. Um, at the time, Kaplan was the general manager of the Nassau Mattress and Bedding Company of Freeport. Um, and we also have Lou Reed. Um, Lou Reed was born in Brooklyn in, um, and grew up in Freeport at 30 Field Oakville Avenue. He was a graduate of Freeport High School in 1959. Um, during those years, he played in a number of bands and made his first recordings as a member of the doo-wop group, The Shades. Um, he was also a member, uh, his family was a member of Congregation B'nai Israel. Um, he graduated from Syracuse University with a BA in 1964, uh, where he expanded his interest in free jazz and other experimental types of music. Um, he moved to New York City and took a job as a songwriter with Pickwick Records. After playing with a few groups, he formed the Velvet Underground in 1965. His solo career started in 1971. He became a widely respected member of the music industry and was inducted in 1996 into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Um, 
and you'll notice on his um, his record uh, there, um, his very famous song "Walk on the Wild Side." You notice that uh, his music label is Oakfield Avenue Music Limited, which is a shout out to the street that he grew up in, in um, on, on in Freeport. Here's a picture of the Freeport Merchants Association. Um, in 1957, um, the officers are, who are shown here are Mervyn Bauman, um, Edor um, Hershenfeld, and Herman Barish. Missing from, from this picture, who were the officers, were uh, Murray um, Neuerer, Irving Grubinor, David Levy, and Milton uh, Danziger. The, the Freeport Merchants Association was organized in 1927. In 1928, the association had 50 members and Adam uh, Litwick served as its president. In 1932, the Freeport Merchants Association merged with the Freeport Chamber of Commerce. Five years later, the association organized again with Irving Grebener as its president. Um, Freeporters' first election day sale was organized by the Freeport Merchants Association in 1949. And during the Christmas season in 1957, the Freeport Mer Merchants Association sponsored a Santa Claus visit which in which Santa Claus arrived by helicopter. Um, in the early 1960s, the Freeport Merchant Stations merged once again with the Freeport Chamber of Commerce, and it became uh, part of uh, the retail uh, division of the chamber. Now, here I just want to mention uh, Dutch Schultz, who was not a Freeport, but does have a, a, a connection to the village of Freeport. Dutch Schultz was a notorious German Jewish gangster. Um, but he is tied to Freeport uh, through rum running, and it is said that he uh, bought a couple of boats from the Freeport Point shipyard owned by the Scoppinage family. Um, and um, uh, that's, uh, I don't think he ever really came to Freeport to get the boats. The boats were probably purchased through a cutout um, who got the boats, but uh, we are told that um, Dutch Schultz did get his boats here in Freeport. All right, I just want to talk to you a little about some of the newspaper coverage that you would people would have seen um, if you know uh, back in the day how uh, Jewish people were described. One of the um, earliest accounts I see here was something in something called the Long Island Farmer in 1901, and this is very interesting. Um, the governor vetoed an amendment for sun for Sunday closing bills, which um, butcher shops wanted, especially Jewish butcher shops, wanted to be open on Sunday because their Sabbath was on Saturday. And the governor vetoed that. So this was something that, you know, um, Jewish, Jewish people had a hard time sort of having to sort of do businesses, do business, especially when you had those Sunday closings. Um, interesting also is, uh, I thought this was interesting, in some of our newspapers, describing um, why businesses that were, a lot of these were owned by Jewish merchants, why they would be closed on certain holidays. So you talk about, you know, Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur, they're explaining, oh yes, the, these, these, these holidays will be observed, these stores will be, will be, will be closed. So I just thought that was kind of interesting. Um, and here is another example of um, somebody explaining Hanukkah, what is Hanukkah um, to, to, uh, to the readers. And this was something in the Temple Messenger, which I, I, I also thought was really interesting. Hanukkah or Christmas, this is from 1946. And, you know, it must have been for, for some Jewish kids very confusing, especially that since the Jewish Merchants Association was so involved with, you know, Christmas sales, and here they are bringing Santa Claus in by helicopter, but they're not practicing Christmas at home. And so this was an article in the Temple Messenger explaining to your children why, you know, Hanukkah is an important holiday. For, for Jewish people. And so how do, how do you explain that uh, to, to your kids? Which I, I thought that was quite interesting. There's also a lot of um, uh, discussions about religious out, outreach within, within the village um, and within surrounding communities. So for example, um, a Hebrew missionary uh, gave a talk at the, the Methodist church in, in Freeport in 1909. We see that in 1929, the rabbi's wife um, gave a uh, sermon um, at the at the temple. Um, and then if, in 1946, um, a, a Methodist minister gave a um, 
gave a talk about um, if I were a Jew um, um, at B'nai Israel in 1946. Um, you also see, um, different mentions of things that um that there's obviously this must be a religious uh they don't mention the name of the the um the the celebration but it's really the redemption of the first uh born son and if you read the article the people come for the for the birth of uh, sigmund calvin's son he's their first son they um they collect monies and coins and at the end, you find out that they they give their money um, for for um, to war sufferers. And so you you see some of these articles about um, you know um, Jewish traditions and, and Jewish religious services. Now there's also a dark side that goes on in Freeport, um, beginning in the 1920s, um, and we see the rise of the Ku Klux Klan here in in the north. Now the Ku Klux Klan in in this area was a lot of it had to deal with um with prohibition um as we know as i've discussed previously there was a lot of rum running going on in the village of freeport and we can see where the clan um starts to get involved and actually um starts um assisting some of the prohibition agents with its enforcing um uh the the, the volstead act in fact was going after certain establishments that they fought might be selling alcohol, um, but nothing ever really got um, out of hand until until um, a couple of years later. And we see that um, there, the one really scary thing that happened was the kidnapping of, of Ernest Lewis. Um, in, the, in 1970s, Herb Jurist, um, who was related to the Posner family, he wrote a, um, a master's paper on the history of the Klan in, in the village of Freeport, which I do have uh, have transcribed and it is available online. And he, he wrote about, um, the name of his, the title of his, his, his piece was Public Activities and Responses to the Ku Klux Klan in Freeport, New York, 1922 to 1933. Um, he kind of describes what was going on in Freeport at that time. And he also reports some really strange things like, uh, a Jewish dentist being offered clan membership by a patient. Um, he also talked about a Jewish merchant who sold clothing to the cl clan, but later admitted that he changed, um, he overcharged them by switching price tags. But the scariest part was, was when um, Ernest Lewis, who owned a drugstore on Bayview Avenue, Atlantic Avenue, was um, later kidnapped by the Ku Klux Klan. And the story goes is that um, a young 13 year old, um, girl said that she was grabbed by Ernest Lewis while in the store with her mother. Um, and, the, you know, um, the mother gets upset. She runs over to the, the police justice, who was Hilbert Johnson, who dismissed the complaint as uh, what, an overreaction. What is thought to have ha has happened is that Ernest Lewis might have sprayed perfume on her collar and said, oh, that smells nice. And um, she took it the wrong way. Uh, it, it's, you also must mention that Ernest Lewis's wife was in the store with him. Um, and, and Herb Jurist, for his research, interviewed all these people that knew the family and knew this person personally. And they were like, this was, this was not something that he would have done. Uh, it would have been completely out of character. But this all blows up in 1924. And it, it culminates with... Um, with Lewis getting uh, threatened by the Klan, being told to leave, um, but he refused to leave. And these are <clears throat> the actual blotter from um, uh, from from the Freeport Police Department in from 1924. And you can see uh, the third one from the bottom is um, the kidnapping of of Ernest Lewis. Um, and what happened is, and this is this is one of the strangest kidnappings I, I think I've ever read about. Um, it was three men and two boys um, kidnap um, Lewis. Um, and during this kidnapping, one of the clan kidnappers uses either cursed or used a vile term. And the other kidnapper, the other clan kidnapper, rebukes him and they kind of have words. So there's a 
while he's getting kidnapped, the two kidnappers are having a fight with each other. Um, they take him to a location outside Freeport um, to drop him off. And then they offer him money just to be like, oh, we'll just, if you had, do you have enough money to get home? I don't know. It was a very, very strange, strange thing uh, that occurred. Um, but it didn't, it didn't stop there. Um, the, the Lou, uh, Lewis decides to leave Freeport. He sells the store and he leaves. But that's not before um, he gets indicted by Nassau County Courts for impairing morals. He was a member of the Freeport Fire Department. His membership later gets um, um, suspended. And after two trials, he is found guilty and uh, is sentenced to 90 days in jail. Um, later, there was a, a Klan parade. And one of the, the um, floats in the parade was entitled We Protect American Womanhood. And it featured a man staring out a store window, leering at a little girl who was surrounded by protective Klansmen. And the name over the store was Enticer. Um, but that was probably the, the, the strangest thing that, that, that did occur um, with the Klan um, in the early 1920s. Um, I also want to just talk a little about the, the, the Milburn Country Club. Um, this country club, um, which was uh, developed in north, the northwest section of Freeport next to Milburn Creek, um, from Stearns Park to Grand Avenue. For many years, the club catered primarily to Jewish patrons. And it started in 1916 by a group of uh, New York City men who met with Hugo, Hugo Stearns, who owned all this land, and they offered to, to start this, they wanted to start this country club. Um, which they did about in 1917. Um, in 1919, membership dues were $100 uh, and an invitation fee was waived um, for early applicants. In 1920, the links were reorganized as the Milburn Golf Course and William Fox of 20th Century, uh, Fox Movie Studio, Marcus Lowe, the theater uh, family, and George McAdee, former um, US, uh, uh, US Attorney General, were all members. For those of you who have been in the sanctuary of B'nai Israel, you will see that there are several names on a plaque dedicated to members of B'nai Israel who died um, in World War II. So I just want to quickly go through who those people were. We have Israel Edelman, uh, who enlisted in 1942. He was awarded the Purple Heart. He died um, at the age of 23. Um, he took basic training at Camp Grubner in Oklahoma. Uh, he was originally interred in France, but then was reinterred at Mount Ararat Cemetery. His family lived at 123 Denhoff Avenue. Arthur Terror uh, Goldsmith was awarded the Purple Heart. He died at the age of 27. Um, he, the New York Times listed his address as uh, 481 Archer Street. He was, a, in, uh, he was originally interred in uh, New Guinea uh, and then was later um, uh, reinterred um, in the Philippines. Um, he entered the army from Los Angeles, California, and uh, his mother was Jenny Goldsmith. L finally, he was finally reinterred at Mount Lebanon Cemetery in Glendale, New York. Warren Albert uh, Golander uh, was awarded the Purple Heart. He died at the age of 22. He entered the army from New York uh, City. He is buried at Mount Ararat Cemetery in Farmingdale. Ernest Minst don't know much about him. I don't think he was a free porter, but I think his uncle uh, was Sidney Mintz of 150 Graffing Place, who served as uh, B'nai Israel's uh, um, financial secretary. Irving Reich was a ward of the Purple Heart. He enlisted in 1943 and died at the age of 19. Um, he lived at 148 Pine Street. He was a graduate of Freeport High School, graduating in 1943, and he is buried at the Wellwood um, Jewish uh, Cemetery in Farmingdale. And um, I had the, um, the Hebrew uh, transcribed, and if I have this right, uh, uh, one of the translate, uh, one of the, the saying says, uh, may his soul be bound up in eternal life. William uh, Serby was awarded the Purple Heart. He died at the age of 26. Um, um, he was on the, the USS President Coolidge, uh, which was a converted luxury liner. 
uh, that hit an American mine during the war somewhere in the uh, southwestern Pacific. He lived at 24 High Place um, uh, in Freeport, and he graduated from Freeport High School in 1935. Um, I mentioned the Temple Messengers. I really need to have those digitized, and I promise I'm going to get to them. That is, that is on my list of things to do. And what I love about them is that they do include such great information about people. And so we have um, all these different little personalities from people's bar mitzvahs. Um, so they're kind of fun to read. Um, we see articles about Zionism and, um, you know, founding of, of Israel. Uh, very interesting stuff here. And here I just want to um, end with um, the 70th anniversary of B'nai Israel. Um, that was part of some information we have uh, at the Freeport Historical Society from uh, courtesy of Rabbi Katz. And finally, I just like to say shalom and say that um, in uh, 2014, the Freeport Landmarks Commission added a roadside marker at the original site of B'nai Israel. Um, and it to sort of um, commemorate its, its importance to the village and the importance to Freeport. And as I mentioned before, it is that building, though it is not a, it is not still a synagogue, it is still a religious building. And it is this, the oldest still standing um, synagogue in Nassau County. So I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. And if you'd like uh, to do more research on the Village of Freeport, here are some, some sources you can use. If you'd like to listen to my oral history of Bernie Calvin and Marvin Cohen, there's a link there to uh, the, our oral history collection. And uh, hopefully someday we can get more and more of those uh, uh, online. Uh, stay tuned. We're going to be hopefully doing a, a couple of other uh, presentations, as I mentioned, maybe hopefully one soon on Bennington Park. And maybe I'll, I'll clean off the one of where Freeport sleeps. So thank you all so much. Have any questions, feel free to email me at any time. Thank you so much.